Reuter and a lot of famous experiments and, and a lot of theoretical work associated with that information theory and uh, transmission and fly, uh, H1 neuron in particular, that stuff I think came out of that first meeting in Brown again uh, over there. Then went to ITP, Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara for a few years, um, continued theoretical work in uh, neuroscience, um, went off to the NEC where I met him, I had my PhD with him, so truth uh, and advertising. Um, and then uh, af after NEC, which is in, uh, that was sort of the Bell Labs over in the uh, in New Jersey for DNC Corporation, he then went to uh, Princeton, he's still there now. Okay, so that, that's, that's enough. You guys don't know who he is, so I'll just let him get that he started. He has quite a few things to talk about, so... Uh, so, so amusingly, in reciting the history, you forgot the part where I was an assistant professor here. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, you know, I, 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 I might take that personally if I... You know. No, no. That's <laughs> <laughs> right, you were here twice. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, don't worry about it. I was more amused, maybe, than the rest of the audience. Um, so it is nice to be back here, actually, and see a number of old friends. And um, since it's the summer, I, I thought I would give a very informal talk, so you guys should feel free to interrupt. And I'm going to do something potentially dangerous, which is to try to tell you a little bit about several things. And on the assumption that, you know, I'll be around for the rest of the day, and if you want to talk some more about one of them, I'm happy to do that. Uh, there's a danger that if we spend too long on one of them, we won't get to all three, which maybe isn't a big loss, but let's give it a try. So the, the three problems I want to talk about, um, one has to do with thinking about networks, one has to do with thinking about prediction, and the last has to do with thinking about information flow. And um, the, the, we're going to choose some example systems, but I hope to convince you that some of the questions are a little more general. So let me just start, and then we'll see how they relate to each other as we go along. So, um, if you think about a network of neurons, uh, you might imagine that they're connected to each other either uh, directly or indirectly from uh, neurons that you don't see, or perhaps uh, they're getting inputs from the rest of the world. But let's um, focus on uh, some piece of the brain. Um, in which there are going to be n neurons. And um, for simplicity, let's think about uh, the activity of this network uh, in very small slices of time. So if I look uh, in a very small window of time, then every neuron either generates an action potential or it doesn't. So if I were to actually stick electrodes into these cells, of course, you would see Um, electrical signals that look like this, but what I want to do is to focus your attention on small slices of time, and in those small slices of time, every neuron either generates an action potential or it doesn't, and so it's described by a binary variable, um, and let's say that if you have an action potential, we're going to have a variable sigma, which is plus one, and if you don't have an action potential, that same variable sigma will be minus one. And so at any instant of time, so the state at one instant then is the set of these binary variables where the sigmas are plus or minus one and i runs from one to n. Now, the problem, of course, is that since these are binary variables and there are n of them, there are, in principle, two of the n possible states. Now, when you think about characterizing what one neuron is doing, um, it's possible to imagine that you're going to do experiments which are, in some sense, complete. You'll, you'll sort of see 
all the different things that that neuron might do over the course of your, your experiments long enough, and let's say your inputs to the system are rich enough, that you'll see it do all the things that it might do. Maybe not, okay? It requires some design and maybe a little bit of faith on your part to believe that you're going to do an experiment that's that complete, but it's possible. If there are two to the n possible states, then n doesn't have to be very large before you can be certain that you will never do an experiment which accesses all possible states. Um, graduate students just don't stay that long, even in Berkeley. Um, so the question then is, what can I tell you about the states of the system um, given that I can't actually access all of them? So you all know that, that um, this is not uh, this is not a new problem. Um, you're also never going to observe all the microscopic states of the gas in this room, but that doesn't stop you from doing statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. So there's an old idea that I should try to do statistical mechanics for networks of neurons. Um, and the way that statistical mechanics ideas have usually been introduced is to make some hypothesis about the dynamics of the network that causes the states of the network to obey the Boltzmann distribution. And it's clear that, that when you do this, you sort of craft your assumptions about the dynamics so that you get the answer that you want. Okay? And that might be okay, or it might start to feel like cheating, depending on your point of view. And so what I want to do is to um, introduce you or, or remind you of a way in which one can build a statistical mechanics for networks like this that doesn't involve any hypotheses about the underlying dynamics and is much more rooted in the data. And the way to do this is the following. 2 to the n is a really big number, but n squared isn't so big. And n squared is how many pairs there are. Well, n times n minus 1 over 2, but you know what I mean. A number of order n squared. And it's routine for people to record from two neurons at once and to tell you about their correlation properties. So if you think about it, if you record from individual neurons and I ask you, tell me how often the neuron fires, well, how often the neuron fires is how often you have sigma equals plus one versus sigma equals minus one. So if I measure the firing rates, that's like measuring the average of each sigma i. And then if I measure the pairwise correlations, that's measuring these objects. And so you could then ask, if I've told you the average of the sigma i's and the average of products of all pairs of sigma i's, what can you tell me about the probability distribution for all of the sigma i's? So why do you want to phrase the problem in this way? Well, I mean, there's many questions you could ask about the network. You could ask dynamical questions, which I'm just not going to address here. Um, and actually, there are generalizations of what I'm going to tell you that allow you to address the dynamical questions, but I'm just going to leave it for the moment. You might want to ask this. Um, is, for example, you might like to know whether um, the states of the network break up into um, sort of isolated, to use a dynamical language, basins of attraction that maybe correspond to um, situations in which you can correct errors, right? So if, if the probability distribution um, consists of a collection, remember, you're in this very high dimensional space, right? So there's two to the n states. So if the states sort of cluster together, that states over here are probable and states over here are probable, but none of the things in between have very much likelihood, then if you see something which is near here, you know for sure that it's in this basin, even if you're not sure exactly what the microscopic state is. And so that gives you a form of error correction. You might also want to know what this probability distribution is because the entropy of this distribution tells you the capacity of the system for carrying information and so on, right? So there's a whole set of questions that if I could write down this probability distribution, I could answer. I know absolutely nothing about the background of most of the people in the room, so um, at, at the minimum, occasional nodding when I use a technical word helps me. 
<laughs> um, and it, if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense, okay, I, I would rather be understood and say less than say more. And so um, out of all the questions you could ask, I, I'd like to be able to answer this one about the probability distribution both quantitatively in terms of questions like entropy and qualitatively in terms of being able to sort of see, visualize what the distribution looks like. Now, of course, you realize that since there are two to the n possible states, this probability distribution is two to the nth numbers. They have to add up to one, but that's not a very big constraint. So you get two to the n minus one. Um, but, and this is only n squared numbers. So obviously, this doesn't determine this. The question is, can you make any progress anyway? And, and the answer is yes, because um, although there's no unique mapping from these things you can measure to the probability distribution, there is out of all the possible distributions. So one way of saying that is there's an infinite set of distributions that are consistent with these experimental data. But out of those, there's one that you might want to look at seriously. And that's the one that has the largest possible entropy. And the reason you want to look at that um, is not for, the, for any reasons about believing that entropy always goes up or anything like that. It's for, the, it's for the simpler reason that the maximum entropy distribution is the one that has the least structure. It's the one that describes a system which is as random as possible given that you've measured something. So um, you may remember that if I ask you for, so I want to choose P to have maximum entropy, given that I've measured the expectation value of sigma i and the expectation value of the products of sigma i. So there's a, a version of this to which you all know the answer, I think, which is if I ask you for the probability distribution on a set of coordinates, um, which I'll call P and Q, uh, that has maximum entropy, and what I know is the average value of some function of those coordinates, P and Q, and if that function has the name energy, then you know that the solution is the Boltzmann distribution, P is proportional to E to the minus beta times the energy. Okay. Now, um, interestingly, in this point of view, uh, the temperature, again, this is something many of you probably know, in this point of view, the temperature, rather than being a sort of primary physical object, is just a mathematical convenience, right? And you adjust the temperature of the system so that the average energy comes out right. Okay, which is a slightly weird way of thinking about it. Usually you think about it that I, the system is at some temperature and I calculate what the average energy is. But if you think about it from this point of view of maximizing the entropy, the temperature is just a Lagrange multiplier that enforces the average value of the energy. The reason this is a useful point of view is that it generalizes. Because what's happened here is that, that I've told you that I want to find a probability distribution that has maximum entropy, but I know a whole bunch of expectation values. So instead of just knowing the expectation value of the energy, which I haven't defined for this system, um, I know a long list of expectation values. I know n of these and n squared of those. What it turns out is that the same calculation that leads you to this conclusion generalizes if you have many things that you know the expectation value of, then each one of them ends up in the exponential with a different Lagrange multiplier. Okay. And actually, if you read Landau and Lisch's physical mechanics book, they tell you this, although they tell, tell it to you in a characteristically encrypted way. Um, so, uh, so for instance, it, one way to think about it, right, is that if you think about a magnet, so for the physicists in the room, if you think about a magnet and I tell you that I know the average magnetization, then that tells you that there ought to be a term up here in which there's some Lagrange multiplier times the magnetization. But that Lagrange multiplier has a name. It's a magnetic field, right? So um, you sort of, you, you kind of know that um, this, the Boltzmann construction generalizes. You just don't usually think about it in that way, okay? So um, if we generalize it to this case, then this solution 
by analogy, is going to be that the probability distribution is proportional to, well, I need Lagrange multipliers to enforce the expectation value of every sigma i. I'm going to give those a name, sum on i. And then I need Lagrange multipliers to enforce the expectation values of every pair of sigma i, sigma j. So I'm going to sum over all the pairs. Of course, I shouldn't count twice. And that is the probability distribution that has the maximum entropy, which is consistent with your measurements, with one slight difficulty, which is that unlike the situation here, right, where you usually claim that you know the energy function and you know what the temperature is, here you don't know what these parameters are. And so you have to do the, the exercise of adjusting them until you match the experimental values for the expectation values. Now, um, what's interesting about this construction, um, as, again, many of you have either know by now or have figured out uh, from listening, is that if I think of this being like the Boltzmann distribution, then by constructing the maximum entropy distribution, what I've done is implicitly to construct an energy function on the states of the system that I'm talking about. And interestingly, the energy function which, com which, you're, which is forced upon you is the energy function of an Ising model with pairwise interactions. If you now go to a real network of neurons and you ask your experimentalist friends to measure these things for you, um, then let me make general remarks and then I'll tell you what happens in a particular case then, you know, these correlations tend to be uh, not terribly strong. So if you think of them in terms of correlation coefficients, 10% is actually a pretty big number. Um, and then, importantly, they don't all have the same sign. Some of them will be positive and some of them will be negative. And so therefore, if you grind through um, the exercise of trying to turn these numbers into these numbers, you will discover that the matrix JIJ has both positive and negative elements. And that means that the Ising model, which you have written down, is plausibly an Ising model which forms a spin glass because, right, there are competing ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic interactions among the spin-like variables. And of course, that was um, one of the analogies that started the efforts of using statistical mechanics models to think about neural networks. But in, here, instead of, as I said at the beginning, instead of sort of conjuring up this statistical mechanics description out of some hypotheses about the dynamics, here what you're doing is saying, I would like you to write down a model which agrees with a set of experimental measurements, but is otherwise as unstructured as possible. So rather than imposing structure of the system, sort of taking it away, right? And nonetheless, what pops out is um, a sort of familiar model. So, um, of course, you realize that in contrast to physical systems, where you know that when you come to equilibrium, the entropy is, near its ma is at its maximum, there's no particular reason to believe that a network of neurons would have the maximum entropy distribution consistent with anything, right? So this is a good guess, and it's a perfectly sensible thing to try, but it's not at all obvious why it should work. So, in fact, it's not at all obvious that it does work. So let me tell you what we've done um, to uh, test out the idea that it might work. And um, this is, much of this is now published. Um, the experimental system that we've thought about is um, an array of neurons in the retina, so looking at a large population of, of retinal ganglion cells as the retina responds to reasonably natural inputs, and we could talk about the details of whether the distribution of inputs matters and so on. Um, for the moment, I think that um, what we're saying is more about networks than about the retina, and so the details probably aren't so important, but if you're curious, we can come back to them. And so the experiments, um, that I'll be particularly talking about uh, were done by Renan Segev, who was then a postdoc in Michael Berry's lab. Uh, 
at Princeton. Ronan is now um, on the faculty at Ben-Gurion University. The theoretical work was begun by Elad Schneidman, uh, who's now at the Weizmann Institute, and continued uh, after Kachik, uh, who's now uh, at Penn, as a postdoc in physics work. Um, so if I tell you that, uh, that this is the model I'm going to write down, and, and by the way, there's a substantial technical difficulty here, um, which I'm just going to leave aside, um, and that is that in order to actually use this approach, you have to be able to solve what is essentially the inverse problem of statistical mechanics. So usually in statistical mechanics, somebody tells you what the energy function is, and your job is to calculate the expectation values that you would observe and the correlations. Here, I've given you the correlations, and it's your job to find the parameters of the energy function. So you have to do the problem backwards. And as most of you know, inverse problems tend to be even harder than forward problems. So this, this is uh, tough, OK? Um, and uh, I would say that at the moment, our approach is slightly better than brute force. Um, but we could talk about directions for doing better than that. There are really interesting theoretical questions there. But onward. So grant me that we can actually solve that technical problem. So how would I tell whether this model was a good model? So one thing you could do is, is you could try baby versions of the problem. So for instance, suppose you take n equals 10. n equals 10 is big enough that there's 1,000 states, and something interesting might happen, right? This probability distribution might actually have some interesting structure. On the other hand, 1,000 is small enough that you can actually sample the probability distribution in a reasonable experiment. So the first thing you might ask, and remember that with 10 neurons, there are of order 100 expectation values, right? I mean, actually 55, right, whatever, right? So um, you're trying to describe the probability distribution that you're going to write down has 1,000 numbers in it, 1,023, right? But the data that you're putting in to determine those is something like 55 measurements. So I mean, you're, you're getting more out than you put in. Right? If I take five neurons, I'm not really getting very much more out than I put in. If I take 10, I have a chance. I have an order of magnitude difference between the number of parameters and the number of things that I predict. So the first thing I do is just ask if I um, look at the probability that you get from the Ising model and the probability that you observe, and of course you want to do this on a logarithmic scale, do they agree with each other? And the answer is yes, to a very good degree. I order any, so this is something you can do at n equals 10. And you might ask yourself, well, all right, if all the neurons were completely independent of each other, then this would work perfectly, but it wouldn't be very interesting. So I have to convince you that some of the actions are actually coming from this term and not just from here. So I could ask instead, what would I get if instead of using the Ising model, I just used the case where they were independent. And then in that case, it turns out that it's a disaster. So um, you end up. So of course, um, there's something that you get right, which is that if you have 10 neurons, then all 10 of them firing at once isn't very likely. And all nine of them fire, fine, nine of them firing at once is a little more likely, and so on. So there's some sort of clustering by how many neurons are actually, how many spins are up that um, you're going to get right, even if your model's completely stupid. But um, in detail, if you examine, let's say, all 10 possibilities in which one neuron generated a spike, what you discover is that the independent model is actually anti-correlated with what you observe. Okay? So in fact, the, it's completely wrong, which is interesting because the pairwise correlations are only of order 10%. So if I asked you, are the correlations in this system weak or strong, if you record from two neurons, you say, well, I don't know, they're only 10%. They're not very big. Um, scientists being what they are, or what we are, this, of course, didn't stop lots of people, including, I'm slightly embarrassed to say, myself once, um, writing papers about the correct interpretation of this 10%. Okay? And actually, it's a surprisingly controversial discussion. I believe that we all missed the point, which is that if you have n elements, 
and essentially all pairs are a little bit correlated with each other, then when you look at the system as a whole, that's actually an effect of order one. And the reason um, I, is easiest um, for uh, people who have a little bit of physics background, and so I'm just going to guess here that that's not too bad a thing to assume. I think I can say this in um, reasonably informal language. If, um, if everybody is a little correlated with everybody else, then you expect that almost all of the terms in this matrix will not be zero. Okay? So that means that this term in the energy of the system has n squared pieces that are not zero. But you all know that energy is supposed to be proportional to the number of elements of the system, the size of the system, right? And in particular, this term clearly only has n elements. So usually when you do thermodynamics, right, if you talk about the magnet and you want to make a model of a spin glass or of a ferromagnet in which every element couples to every other element, you want to discuss the mean field model, you're supposed to scale things. You're supposed to put a 1 over n out here to make this term be the same order as that one and to have the energy come out proportional to the size of the system. Well, what does that mean? It means that the correlations that you expect to see in a mean field system should be order 1 over n. So in fact, if all n squared elements are correlated, uh, all n squared correlation elements, correlation coefficients, are significantly non-zero, the naive expectation would be they would all be order 1 over n. Now, if you stick electrodes into two nearby cells in the cortex, and you grab two cells out of 10,000, maybe, which are in some little region, you find that they're a little bit correlated with each other. But the strength of their correlations is not 1 over 10,000. It's not even 1 over 100, because there are certain situations which you might guess it would be 1 over square root of n instead of 1 over n. So, and another way of saying this is that if I write is, if you think about models for public opinion formation, right, if you form your opinions based on listening to all n people in the room, then you would expect that um, the correlations in the fluctuations of your opinion, right, not, not the fact that there's an overall collective effect where you all agree on something, but the correlations between your opinions, between any two people, would be order one over n, right, because I listen to you, but for you and I to become correlated, right, that only happens if perchance you're the one who pushes me over to deciding yes in contrast to what all these other people said. Right? So if there's this slightly counterintuitive thing, which is that if everybody's a little bit correlated with everybody else, you expect the correlations to be smaller. And the fact that the correlations are not that small is actually a hint that there's something collective going on. Good question? Yeah, I, I have a question to the, the beginning of the argument. You said if all, the, all, all pairs are correlated, you would expect that all the coupling terms are yes. non-zero. That was probably has an extra assumption that all everybody is equal. So, so if okay. You have just one row, non -zero, yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Ah, uh, no. Uh, right. So. Zero, then you would still have um. Well, three. but then. Uh, yes. I mean, this was a hand waving argument, but. So. One person talks to everyone. Ah. So so there's a there's a question of of um, problem you can solve right, which is if uh. Yes, right. So you're saying, suppose you have the model, there's just one guy, and he just tells everybody else what to think, right? Um, it's a totally unrealistic model in, in, in all contexts. Um, but but um, have you ever tried this? No, sorry. Anyhow, uh, so um, yes, in that, that's a sort of strange situation um, for, for these arguments. So right, so the argument I was making was on the assumption that the correlations don't have some very special structure to them. Um, there's actually, let, let me come back to this, okay? If I don't say anything more about it, ask it again after the talk is over. Because there's a very interesting question here about whether the exact form of the correlations matters or whether you could say something only know, you know, if I knew generally something about the correlations, but I didn't know what the whole matrix looked like. Okay, so um, anyhow, the, as I say, this was an argument to, to give you a hint that there is something interesting going on that, that's sort of collective in its character. 
And indeed, that, that's borne out in the sense that um, assuming the cells are independent is not a bad approximation for two cells, but quickly becomes a disastrous approximation when you even talk about 10 cells. Um, what you, if, if you go beyond 10, of course, you can't do this test because you can't measure the probability distribution. So what you do is you say, well, I, I measured pairwise correlations, so instead I'll um, look at the triplet correlations and look at the ones that are predicted by the Ising model versus the ones that are observed and ask whether I get things right. And this is actually a little harder because many of the triplet correlations are, are both predicted and observed to be very small. So a lot of the data is sitting down here um, and is basically just sampling error, right? Yes? What are the points in the top um, So this was, whoops, uh, inconsistent use of colors, sorry. Um, let's do that. So this was, um, I was trying to convince you that if I use the Ising model to predict the probabilities of all 2 to the 10th states, I get them basically right. Um, whereas if I pretend that the cells are independent of each other, which might seem like a good approximation since all the correlation coefficients are less than 10%, you get them drastically wrong. And so the, the point of the sketch is to emphasize that, that although you get right the idea that it's more common for one neuron to spike than for two neurons to spike than for three neurons to spike, in detail you get the patterns almost backwards. You have a point for every state. You have a point for every state, right, because 1,024 isn't that big. The other interesting thing to note is that um, some of these points really are very far from the line. So there are combinations of spiking and silence in populations of 10 cells, which if the cells were independent of each other, you would expect would occur a couple times a year, and they occur 10 times in 20 minutes, and vice versa. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. So for, forget about theory. It's a really interesting point about you know, how do you do experiments to characterize a network of interacting elements. You measure the correlations between pairs and you say, oh, well, you know, they're not very big. But then you look at a whole group and you realize that, that there are the states of the group are incredibly badly predicted by something. So there's a lesson there that, that um, so in, the, in, in some cases, this would not be true, right? So if I'm correlated with you, and you're correlated with the person behind you, and you're correlated with the person behind you, and you're, we're each correlated by 10%, but, but, the, but my correlation with the person who's two steps away is only 1%, then if you pretended everybody was in the it wouldn't be so bad, right? Because they're, right, you're 10% off in what you do with your neighbor, and 1% off in what you do with your second neighbor, and there's no way for everything to sort of loop back around and, and build up, right? But if everybody's a little bit correlated with everybody else, then you have these large number of loops that go through the system, which, of course, is how order emerges in statistical mechanics, so we know why this happens. So, okay. So if you have bigger systems, um, you know, let's say n equals 40, then you can do this test of asking whether you're getting the three-point correlations right even though you built the system only out of two-point correlate, your model only out of two-point correlations. And to a large extent, that also works, although you start to see that it's not perfect. You're making errors. Another thing you can do, um, which is interesting, I think, is to say, um, and this is really the point I, I wanted to get to, um, is to say, well, let me think about groups of neurons. And if I did an experiment, for instance, in which, oh, sorry, let, let, let me say it the following. I, I give you this model. And of course, there's no temperature in this problem, right? There's nothing analogous to, to beta, because energy is only something that emerges after I look at the calculation. But if I write down this probability distribution, I can certainly imagine that what's really happened is that somebody has given me a statistical mechanics problem in which this is the Hamiltonian. And then I can insert a temperature if I want to. Okay? So this is me doing this, right? It's not the system. The real system operates at temperature t equals 1. But what I could ask is, as I change the temperature, what happens? Right? And you know that if you lower the temperature, of course, the system's going to drop down into the states of lowest energy. And as you raise the temperature, everything's going to randomize. But is there anything special about the point t equals 1 where the system actually operates? <laughs> 
Okay, which is a way of asking, out of all these coefficients, they have some set of values. Is there anything special about them, right? Other than the fact that they happen to fit the data. So one way to ask that is, well, I, I'll perturb them and ask what changes. But they're n squared of them, so this is a terrible thing to do. So instead of moving all of them in all different directions, let me do a simple thing. Just try scaling them all up and down and see what happens. Well, that's equivalent to changing the temperature. So I'm going to examine one direction in parameter space, which I have some intuition about, and ask whether there's anything special about the point where I happen to be operating. So but what am I going to measure as I go along this curve? Well, OK, this is the one where you just say, I know how to do this because I took a statistical mechanics course. What I should do is I should measure the specific heat as a function of temperature. OK, why do you want to do this? Well, one reason is that if you measure the specific heat as a function of temperature, you can do an integral and determine the entropy. And the entropy has a meaning that we understand, right? In this context, it tells you about coding capacity and so on. Another way of thinking about the specific heat is that it's the in appropriate units, it's the variance of the energy. So the energy is the log probability. So when I measure the specific heat, I'm asking you, do all the states basically, do I have lots of states that basically all have the same probability, or is there a large dynamic range where some states are very probable and some states are very rare? You expect that as systems become large, right, the usual thing that happens, so this is the thermodynamic limit in statistical mechanics or typicality of sequences in information theory, where all the states that you actually observe start to have almost the same probability. But so you're asking about the variance. How what you find is that if you take a group of 10, so here's t equals 1, uh, which is the place where things, the, the, the real system operates. Um, if you take a small group of cells, um, you know, you get something that looks like this. It's not very interesting. If you take a slightly larger group of cells, you get something that looks like that. And um, by the time you get to, let's say, n equals 20, so I don't know, this is 5, 10, 20, you're starting to wonder if maybe there's a meaningful peak emerging. And you say, well, OK, I, I could go to 40 because we have data from 40 cells. And the peak keeps emerging. It's rising, and it's moving toward um, t equals 1. So does this mean anything? Well, what I'd like to do is to be able to go beyond 20 or 40 cells. And as we speak, um, in Michael's lab, um, electrode arrays are being fabricated that allow you, that will allow you to result in a retina where all correlations are reasonably homogeneous. And so we'll know the answer experimentally, assuming that we can actually analyze the data. Um, of course, now we'll have to solve the inverse problem, not for 40, but for 200, which is much more difficult. But, you know, it's only computer power. Um, but um, along the way, we decided to try something a little different. So, so, you know, since we had data from 40 cells, you can pick groups of 20 in many different ways. So you could ask, if I choose groups of 20 in many different ways, of course, the details are different. These are different neurons. They're responding to different visual features and everything else. But if I ask you this sort of thermodynamic question about the specific heat, which is essentially asking you about the, the, what does the distribution of states look like? Not what, do the, what are those states microscopically in terms of which they're firing, what do they mean in terms of the visual world? What does the distribution look like? The answer is that different groups of 20 look surprisingly similar. And so you get a little error bar around this. So the whole curve of specific heat versus temperature is pretty reproducible from one group of 20 to the next. And you say, OK, well, if that's true, maybe it actually didn't matter that the 20 were 20 particular cells out of this group of 40. So let me make up a group of 20 cells by looking at all the expectation values of the sigmas that I saw in the experiment and just pulling 20 numbers at random and look at all the pairwise correlations that I saw and pull 20 squared, well, over two <laughs> numbers at random. You have to be a little bit careful because you know these are binary variables and so not all combinations of means and correlations are accessible, but that's easy to deal with. Um, and if I pick those networks, which, don't really, which are in some sense statistically typical of the networks that I've seen, but don't correspond to any one in particular, and I do the calculation again, what do I get? And the answer is that you get something that isn't exactly the same, but overlaps quite well. 
So this suggests that maybe you should be bold and imagine that the cells that you recorded from are typical of this much larger patch that Michael and his colleagues are trying to record from now. And let me imagine, for instance, that I have 120 cells and I go through the same procedure of picking averages of sigma i and averages of the product sigma i, sigma j out of the distributions that I've observed and fill in the now 120 by 120 correlation matrix with these elements at random and go through this whole exercise again. In fact, you should do it a few times, um, but not too many because it's a very big problem. And what you discover is that by the time you're looking at 120 cells, you're seeing, if I put it on the same axis, something that looks like this, with now a very sharp peak in specific heat, which is within a few percent of T equals 1. Now, again, those of you who um, know this stuff, realize that this is the signature of a second order phase transition. And this tells you that we are, if this continues when I look at larger systems, then the sort of thermodynamic limit for this network of neurons as it became large would actually be operating exactly at its critical point. Okay. So let me make an observation here before telling you about what this means. Um, uh, full disclosure. There are ideas that have been floating around in the sort of, let's say, physicists think about the brain literature for a very long time. One is these statistical mechanics ideas for thinking about neural networks. Another one is the idea of self-organized criticality, that networks have very interesting behaviors when they poise themselves near critical points. Okay? Um, I always thought that this thing about self-organized criticality as applied to biological systems was sort of vague gibberish myself. Um, it might be a good idea, but I never found any of the arguments for why it should be true very compelling. And um, the reason that we went through this exercise the first time was because, like many people, we were absolutely convinced that all the really interesting things that happened in these networks were the result of very high order structures, right? So if you see five cells firing at once, that's presumably because there's something special about those five cells. And the reason we wanted to do this maximum entropy construction was to sort of clear out all the uninteresting part that comes as a consequence of the pairwise correlations. And so what we found is that actually we better find the pairwise stuff interesting because that turns out to be most of what's going on. And that if you take what's going on in the pairwise model seriously, you end up predicting the system is poised at a critical point, which is really quite astonishing. In fact, it's sufficiently astonishing that you might worry that since this model is presumably not exactly correct, you would like to have another way of getting at this idea of operating near a critical point. And so it turns out that there is a way of doing that, um, which is hard, but, but kind of works. And that is that, um, and this was done, uh, well, okay, we have one more guy, Thierry Mora, doing the effort. Um, and the idea is, is uh, very simple, really. Um, if I take a system of some size, then I can try to measure the probability of a particular state, right, of, oh, let's say P of sigma i, and I measure minus its logarithm, and that's supposed to be an energy, right? But you know that energies are supposed to be proportional to the size of the system. So I can take this thing and divide by n. Now, of course, as n gets to be large, it gets harder and harder to sample all the states. But the low energy states, which you populate reasonably often, those you can still sample, right? So in fact, you can measure the, you can measure these numbers and for low energies, you keep getting them right as the system gets bigger and bigger. It's the high energy that you don't get right. But then you could also ask, since for every state, you can assign it an energy, you could ask how many states are there in the system that have energy E? And of course, when you count how many states are there with an energy E, that's the entropy, or the logarithm of that number is the entropy. So if I count the number of states um, for uh, minus log P over N is less than something I'll call epsilon, right, then this should be something like E to the entropy. But again, entropy should be proportional to the size of the system. So let me put a factor of N here. <laughs> 
And so I can just count. Right? And as the system gets bigger and bigger, I, I'll see what I get. And so what you're doing essentially is counting. Um, for every state, you find out what its log probability is. And then you count how many states are there that have that log probability or greater. And um, you then plot these against each other. Yes? But should entropy be growing inside the system if you've got fixed magnitude for pairwise correlations? Yeah, it's not completely clear. So it's not, ob it's not obvious. So it's not obvious that the sort of passage to a thermodynamic limit is going to be easy in this problem. So we just try. Let's see what we get. As many of you know, if you could show me this plot, then you could recover all of the thermodynamic functions. Okay. So usually you think about things as a function of temperature, right? But if you go to the microcanonical ensemble, you think it was a function of energy. If I tell you entropy is a function of energy, then that gives you all of the thermodynamics. Um, what does it mean to be at a critical point? Well, it means you have infinite specific heat. So um, the temperature, right, is the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy. And the specific heat going to infinity is the same as the second derivative going to zero. So um, the way the real system is at temperature one, so when I make this plot with real data, I sort of need to draw a line of slope one, and the place where it touches the system, that's, that's the, the energy that would be the average energy in the thermodynamic limit. And then if I want to know the specific heat, I just look for the second derivative there. Well, the amazing thing is that as you start trying to do this, if you take the real data, the plots that you get are almost indistinguishable from a straight line with slope 1, which means you found the place where temperature equals 1, and the second derivative is 0 because it's a straight line, which means the specific heat is going to infinity. So by doing this construction, you get at this idea of a critical point in a completely independent way. Now, it's still very rough, okay, which is why there's no paper about this in the case of uh, neurons. There is one in the case of images where you can generate more data. You can see related things. But um, what I think is interesting about this is that um, it suggests that the system sort of taking the correlation structures that you measure seriously leads you to a really pretty striking prediction that the system is operating at this very special point. And then you have at least the possibility of trying to measure something completely different about the system, which doesn't pass through this model construction and recover the same ideas. And it corresponds essentially to the claim that you're at a point where the variance of log probability is as big as it can be, which means in a sense that the states of the system Right? Again, you might expect that as the system got larger and larger, the states that you observe would tend to have more and more the same probability. They'd be typical. But in fact, the approach to that typicality is being slowed down by this divergence in the variance of the log probability, which means that the system takes on states with very, with very wide dynamic range, and if you want, the surprise. Right? So it means that the states of, of the, the configurations of spiking and silence that are coming out of the retina vary enormously in how surprising you should find them. Right? They have very different probabilities. And that's even true when you normalize by the number of neurons and everything else. It's still very broadly distributed. And you know, the world in which we live presumably varies widely in how surprising it should be by anything that happened in the last uh, uh, few tens of milliseconds or so. And if you want to represent that, so normally when you think about trying to represent information efficiently, this isn't what you want to do, right? When you want to represent information efficiently, you should use all of the symbols in your alphabet as equally as possible. But the cost of doing that is that since what's coming into you involves things of very different probabilities, you have to do something like block coding to sort of package up pieces of it and that, until you find blocks that are of equalized probabilities. Okay? But that incurs delays. And so maybe the principle which is operating here, the reason that you do this, is that it allows you, by maximizing the sort of dynamic range of log probability for the states of the system, it allows you to represent a world in which surprise varies enormously with a huge dynamic range without incurring large penalties for delays. Okay? But we don't know whether that's right. <laughs>
I mean, that's an idea. At the moment, we're still trying to understand whether this is really true. And obviously, so far, you know, the data takes us up to here. And what we would like to do is to understand what happens when we record some order of 100, 200 neurons. And so within the year, we will presume we know the answer to this. So um, as, predict as might have been um, predicted, I talked about one out of the three things. So let me take, with your permission, let me take five minutes and tell you um, about these other ideas. And um, if people are interested in more things, we can, we can go on with the discussion. But yeah, sure. It's very important that, so the reason why I think we're probably telling you things that are more about, um, about networks than about the retina is because these experiments are done on the salamander retina. Salamander, um, you find rather large numbers of neurons in the retina with overlapping receptive fields. And so if you draw a circle, which is, let's say, the, the outer reaches of the classical receptive field, then um, within that circle, there's a very large number of cells. They're presumably not all tuned to the same thing. They're tuned to subtly different features, and there's a whole field of classifying neurons in the retina, which um, at one point I tried to learn about, um, and we even took some forays into, um, and um, it's a very contentious field. Cajal said there were 11 types of cells, and there are still 11 types of cells. What they are changes, how we measure them changes, but Cajal got it right. Um, so if you get a different answer, you have a problem. Um, now, in, in contrast, right, in, in, in the primate retina, you know, there's cells of class three, and they form a pretty regular array, and their receptive fields said touch each other, right? And so um, that would be different, right? <laughs> You'd expect something more, that would be more like, as you said, if you, if you think about the whole thing, obviously the neurons over here are doing something completely neuro different than the neurons over here. And in that sense, this idea, for instance, that I could fill in the correlation matrix by choosing at random out of some homogeneous distribution would be missing the geometry. So within an area of about 200 cells in the, in the salamander retina, there seems not to be a geometry. Right? So if I plot the correlation coefficient of the two cells as a function of the distance between the centers of their receptive fields, of course, if I take them out here, yes, it's falling off. But in some region, you basically have absolutely no correlation between distance and, and correlation coefficient. And so you're just sampling out of some range of correlation coefficients. And so it's within that region. So I think in order, in order for this discussion to make sense, you have to imagine that there's some population um, in which it makes sense to talk about um, the typical correlation between a pair. If you're already talking about a region so big that the correlations are falling off with distance, then this discussion has to, has to be modified substantially. So um, just to, uh, let, let me do this in, in the opposite order. Um, I tried to emphasize that, that this business of operating at a critical point is special because it, it does have a special meaning from an information theoretic point of view. Um, it has a special meaning from a thermodynamic point of view, but that has an information theoretic corollary, which is this, you know, the log probability has an enormous variance, in fact, has its maximal variance, um, which means that in some way you're representing states of very different surprise. There's, as I mentioned, this is in contrast to um, a sort of conventional view in which what you're trying to do is um, use the system as efficiently as possible by equalizing the probabilities um, of all the different states. And um, in a tribute to our own um, schizophrenia about these things, perhaps, um, we've been trying to think about um, these ideas which have their origins, well, certainly they have a, they have a strong history um, in the context of neuroscience. For example, a, an idea which many of you are familiar with is that if you have a, a neuron um, that has an input and an output, then if you have a probability distribution for your inputs that looks something like this, then if you want, if the output is some continuous variable and you want to make sure that you use all of the values, let's say between zero and one equally often, then you know that you should arrange the input-output relation um, like this so that 
um, it's essentially the cumulative, uh, the integral of the probability distribution. And more generally, if you have a system w which is in which the output is trying to transmit information about the input, but, but transforms it in some way, then you know that um, to make sure that the output provides as much information as possible about the input, you have to make sure that the transformation, that the input-output relation, is actually matched to the distribution of inputs. And, you know, at some level, completely trivial, because, you know, if the distribution of inputs was over here, the output would always be one, and it doesn't tell you anything, right? So you know that some matching relation has to be made, and, and you can formalize this by asking for the relationship which maximizes the information transmission. It turns out that this formulation, which goes back at least to Laughlin's work in, in the fly retina, where he looked at the um, input-output relation of the second-order neurons, so taking the input to be the light intensity, output to be the graded voltage that they produce, um, there's something missing from this, which is that um, I have to, the statement that, that um, you want to use all the output levels equally often is implicitly a statement, I mean, if the real principle is that you want to maximize how much information you're transmitting, then that only becomes use all the output levels equally often if you assume something about the noise in the system. So um, if the noise level in the system, which you can think of as little error bars attached to this input-output relation, is homogeneous along the whole range and small, then you get this answer, okay? But in general, you don't. Now, in in system, we could discuss whether in the problem that Laughlin was actually doing, this was a good approximation or not. But there are certain situations in which it can't be a good approximation. So for example, if you think about inputs and outputs not in the nervous system, but in a cell where you're trying to control the expression of a gene, and the input is the concentration of the transcription factor that binds to the DNA, and the output is the expression level of the gene, then although input-output relations tend to look like this, the noise level can't be constant. Because the noise ultimately comes from the random arrival, random individual molecular events. And over here, there are no molecular events, and so the variance must be zero, right? And over here, there are lots of molecular events, and so the variance, presumably, it's some square root of n thing going on, right? So in the case where you think about um, this idea in a more molecular context, you can be absolutely certain that the, no the structure of the noise level will affect the, s the, the solution. Unfortunately, there aren't very many cases in which we actually know this to be able to test it out. Um, but a set of colleagues and I actually, uh, for originally different reasons, um, started to, to look at this in, in a very particular context, which is in the very initial events in, in the development of the fruit fly embryo, which is a fantastic model system for these things. And so what we're, what we're trying to do is to take some of the ideas that have floated around for many years in the context of neuroscience about maximizing information transmission and so on, and sort of drop them down to this very molecular level and see how they play out. And we've been very encouraged because um, in the first instance, so um, if this is the embryo of the fruit fly, then the mother, um, by placing the messenger RNA for um, particular proteins at, at different ends of the embryo, establishes a, a gradient in the concentration of the protein. And then this is a transcription factor which serves as the input. And then there are these sigmoidal input-output relations. If you have a gradient that looks like this and a sigmoidal input-output relation, then the output is going to have a spatial pattern that looks like that. And of course, that means that you've cut the embryo in half, and you know, this can become the head and that can become the backside. And that's not exactly how development works, but it's the right idea. Okay? You take continuously graded things, you pass them through sigmoidal input-output relations, and you end up drawing lines. And those lines become the body segments, eventually. Okay? There are many steps. So what we did, and we um, was a fantastic graduate student, uh, Thomas Greger, uh, who's now at the University of Tokyo, but I'm happy to say is coming back to Princeton uh, within the year as a professor in the physics department. And um, my colleagues, David Tank, who most of you know for other reasons, uh, and Eric Vishaus, um, we, we tried to look at one of these this sort of very first input-output relation. And what Tomas did was a whole variety of things, but um, basically you can look at every single nucleus, at least on one side of the embryo, and you can measure the concentration of the input molecule, and you can measure the concentration of the output molecule. Um, 
sometimes more directly than others, but that's a technicality. And so you can get this input-output relation, and you can measure these noise levels. And there's actually a really interesting structure, which is that the output noise, right, the variance of the output at fixed input, is actually big in the middle and then falls to either side. And you can think of this as being like noise in ion channels, right? When the ion channel is half open, that's when the current variance is the biggest. And so it's the, the same idea here. And this is because there's an important source of noise, which is the random arrival of the input molecules at their target site. Okay? If all that was happening was randomness in making the output molecules, then it would be like shot noise through the channel, and it would just grow in proportion to how much current there is, that is to say, how much output there is. But if you actually have an effect with a system's changing state between being active and inactive, then that peaks in the middle, and that's what you see. Interesting, slightly off the point. What's really important here is that if you have a system with this structure for the noise, then it's not matched to this distribution. It's actually matched to a distribution, um, well, let me say it another way. If the noise level were uniform, and I looked at the probability distribution of the output, right? If the noise level is uniform, then the distribution of output should be flat. And that's how you derive the mechanism. If the noise level has this structure, then it turns out that the optimal distribution is bimodal, right? Because you should avoid the state, don't say things that you can't say reliably, right? If you, use, if you have symbols to choose from an alphabet, and some of them, every time you use them, you make mistakes, don't use those as often. What I want to emphasize is that just as in Laughlin's analysis, which I'm sure most of you have seen, the, the relationship here is parameter-free, right? If somebody tells you what this is now the relationship looks like, you can draw this probability distribution with no free parameters. It's harder than in the case that Laughlin did, but no matter, there's, still no, there's no room for any extra parameters because of the, the, the problem is harder. So now you can go, you can go back to these images where you see every single nucleus, and you can go measure what the probability is that the output has whatever value that it does, and you see that it fits extraordinarily well. Um, so this isn't the whole problem any more than Laughlin's discussion is the whole problem in the retina, but I think it's um, very encouraging in the same way. So um, this is long enough. Um, I didn't get to talk about prediction, but it's all right. Um, what ties these two parts of the talk together is the idea that the operating point of these systems is somehow special. And we don't know what the specialness is, right, going in. We would like to believe that there's some theoretical principle from which you could derive something about how the system works, at least approximately, right, would give you a start on how the system works. And that, in a sense, even if you sort of fit all of your data, there would be something about the parameter values that was special other than the fact that it happened to fit all the data, which is a good thing, but um, by itself may not represent that much understanding. So what to our, in the context here, we're basically taking an idea which has had some success in the context of neurons and kind of dropping it down to a much more molecular level where, for instance, these details about um, noise level as a function of input or output or as a function of state really have a very specific um, physical interpretation about randomness and the arrival of molecules. And in some sense, there's a little less wiggle room about um, what the shapes of these things are supposed to be and so on. Um, and we're finding what I would characterize as being very encouraging results, and this is work uh, by Gaspar Tkachik um, and Kurt Callan and myself, um, in addition to the experiments done by these guys. And then in the context of thinking about networks, um, what we're seeing is that the system seems to be operating, again, at, at, at some very special point that has an information theoretic meaning, although it was a surprising one because it's, it's not the usual notion of being efficient in an information theoretic sense, and we're still trying to come to grips with this. And so the first part of the talk was really about trying to zoom out and think about the, how do I go from things that I can measure to say something about the collective behavior of the whole network. This part of the talk is actually zooming in on one of these arrows, one transformation, and trying to understand what's the connection between the signals that arrive at this point and the way in which they get transformed. And obviously, in order to really understand what's going on, I have to be able to put the two halves of that together, um, which we certainly don't know how to do yet. So maybe that's a good place to stop. Thanks.
state so that this guy can run forward, but then when he run for, runs forward, there's some stochasticity in that process, which is doing a sort of square root of n in counting the molecules you make, and there's a square root of n of the molecules arriving at their sites. Okay. So when you change the shape of the input-output relation, um, you also change what you predict for the noise. If you know two numbers, and the numbers you can essentially think of as <coughs> what is the maximum number of independent molecules I can make at the output, and what's the maximum number of independent input molecules I can count, which is a sense which in appropriate units is the absolute concentration of this signal over here. Right? So you could then say, well, um, I can, instead of just deriving a matching relationship between here's the distribution and here's the input-output relation, I say, well, okay, the way I did this was I gave you the input-output relation and predicted the distribution. Laughlin tried to do it the other way. Um, that's just a question of which one you measured first, okay? That's it's a, it's a matching condition, right? It doesn't, it's not the case that one, one goes first logically. But um, theoretically, you could say, well, suppose that I, match, I, I give you an input-output relation and then I optimize the distribution. I could now ask, can I then do another level of optimization and optimize the input-output relation? And the answer, of course, is no. Because if it's not constrained, the answer is, you should just make lots more molecules, and then square root of n will cause the fractional noise level to go down, and you'll transmit more information. So the natural constraint is to say, well, you can only make this many molecules. But actually, since there's both an input and an output, you need two of those numbers. Given those two numbers, you can now do the, you can now do the optimization again. And so it's constrained, but it's constrained by something very physical. And um, we're far from done. But uh, it's quite remarkable. You might worry that if you did that, you'd, the optimization would drive you off into some completely unrealistic parameter regime. Um, I don't know. This would become switch-like with infinite cooperativity. Or it would become very linear because, you know, you're trying to make as much use of your dynamic range as possible so you make the results very graded. Or, you know, this thing would always be pinned in the middle um, of your dynamic range. Or, so, you know, something would happen which would immediately clue you in that this is not a biology work. So none of that happens. Um, if you take realistic values for the total number of input and output molecules, you discover that the optimal input-output relations are perfectly sensible things with intermediate levels of cooperativity that sit somewhere. I mean, obviously, they don't sit all the way at one edge or the other, but they do move around depending on parameters. And if you have multiple outputs, then they arrange themselves in interesting ways. Um, you even find that if you have multiple outputs that interact with each other, Actually, this is worth saying because it connects to things people know from neuroscience. If I tell you that instead of having one signal that does this, I have several outputs, then of course this guy, you know, if this is the out, if this turns out to be the optimal input-output relation for number one, then of course, if as depending on the noise level, which is say depending on how many molecules you have, it might be that the best thing to do is just be completely redundant, right? If the signal noise ratio is very bad, I should just keep telling you the same thing over and over again in the hopes that you'll finally get it, right? But if you get above that, then of course it's, uh, it's no help to put them right on top of each other, right? So you start spacing them out. But of course if you space them out, you have the problem that they become redundant, right? Because up here, since this guy's already on, um, or put it another way, now that this guy is on, you don't need to know that the other guys are on because you already know the concentration is up here. So what's the solution to this redundancy? Well, you all know the answer. It's lateral inhibition. Right? Just, just like the nervous system. And so you, say, you find the same thing here. If you start allowing for this network to interact, you discover that the optimal solutions are ones in which these repress each other. Right? In neurobiology, you have inhibition and genetic field repression. Kind of um, and this is interesting because, actually, if you look at the network of interactions in the early Drosophila embryo, you have, um, you know, the, this molecule really does excite, to use the neurobiologist language, several different genes, which all inhibit each other. And what we're trying to do now is to see, okay, is it more than just a kind of hand-waving similarity, or can I really predict, you know, ex I mean, if I really get that right, then I'll tell you exactly where these boundaries should be, and, you know, one of them, one of them will look like this, and one of them will look like that, because, like, this guy's being excited by this, and so as the concentration goes up, it turns on, but then this one turns on, and then it turns the other one off. 
you should be able to get all this stuff right. And well, I wouldn't be telling you even this much if I didn't think you were going to get some of it right. But we're not quite there yet. But yeah. Sir, but also the input can change over the time, correct? You ah. are assuming right now that you have one molecular complex, but that molecular complex during the transcription can recruit another protein. So, okay, so the discussion we're having here um, uh, in the first half of the talk, time didn't matter because all the slices were very, very small. In the second part of the talk, time doesn't matter because it's all very long and we've reached a steady state. Real systems, of course, are presumably somewhere in between, but um, I, you know, I think at least to get started, I don't mind starting in the limits and, and working back. Um, in truth, uh, okay, so one of the things that Tomas did was um, to actually observe this, uh, the, the absolute concentration of this input molecule um, in live embryos for the first time. And um, he could show that if you sit at this nucleus and wait, um, of course, the nuclei are dividing, mm -hmm. right? So when, it, when the nucleus opens up, um, all the stuff rushes out, so the concentration drops, but then two nuclei take its place, and if you go back to the same position in space and measure the concentration, you come exactly back to the same level uh, within 10%, which, by the way, is a completely non-obvious fact, right? It's not obvious why this should be true. Um, but it does make you think that it may be okay to talk about a constant input. Probably not completely fair, but it's not, a, it's not as silly a place to start as um, one might have thought initially. So uh, back to the first part of your talk, uh, when you said that the, the theta, when you try to predict the probability of mm -hmm. each state, uh, when you take care mm -hmm. of the Paris coordination, it's much better. Um, what was the theta? Does that depend on the stimulus? So, okay. So, um, the experiments were done with reasonably naturalistic movies. Um, again, we could discuss, you know, what's natural for a salamander and what's natural for us. Um, if you do it with uh, um, sort of somewhere between spatiotemporal white noise and something a bit colored, everything still works. If you go all the way to a kind of full field flicker, then all hell breaks loose, and, and as you might expect. Right? Um, so, um, I think one of the things that's interesting, so one of the things we'd like to understand, right, is that you know that the statement that the system has some particular set of correlations is a combination of what stimuli we use, what the anatomy is, and what the adaptation state is. And, well, I, I assume the anatomy stays fixed, right? So if we change the distribution of inputs, we know that, that on some time scale, the system's also going to change its adaptation state. And so presumably, if we make a very drastic change in the distribution of inputs, sort of all the rates and correlation coefficients will jiggle around, and then as the system adapts, we're going to come back to something. And usually we think about adaptation kind of, although it might be a network effect, we usually think about its consequences for the output of individual neurons. So what we'd like to understand here is, does, does it have a, by, by moving these correlation properties around, does it have a consequence for the sort of collective state of the network? And so I, I think the answer is that on short time scales, changing the distribution of inputs will change everything. But if you allow the system to adapt back, it's, I mean, obviously, I could still make a distribution to which it can't, which it can't compensate for, but um, it might be that that there are some of these sort of quasi thermodynamic quantities that sort of get preserved when you get to the end point of the adaptation. And it, I mean, that by itself would, I think, be really interesting. So it's what we're trying, one of the things we're trying to do now. But connected to that question, I mean, isn't somehow the JIJ, what's the interpretation of that? Does this somehow reflect some connections between the neurons, or, or does it reflect some common input, or some, some input that comes, okay. or some correlation that comes to the stimulus? Okay. And so there I'm a little bit confused. Okay, so you're, you're, you're right to be confused. Um, so, so let me um, unpack this uh, partly by reference to other work. So other people have tried this. Uh, notably, John Schlenz and Igor Chosnitsky at, at SOC have done this on primate retina, and they've focused on um, spontaneous activity in, in the whole Now, they are in in some sense, the pattern of correlations 
at least must be more closely connected to the anatomy. So even if the interpretation of the JIJ is not that the two neurons are connected to each other, it's presumably that there's a photoreceptor up here, which through the intermediate layers is projecting to both of these bipolar cells, and that's where the correlation comes from. Okay? So in that sense, if I observe that um, there's a non-zero JIJ between these elements, it's presumably I should be able to point to something in the circuit that that is also non-zero, right? Because it's not stainless steel anymore. No, it's spontaneous, right? And presumably, the, the what, which is to say, it's driven by um, by the noise, the noise in the unit disc. Now, um, in our case, uh, we've tried. Um, so, let, so that's a that's a case where I think that if you want to go in that direction, it's you're going to get further. Now. Um, let me make a couple points about, about our situation. First of all, um, a general point that I think sometimes people forget about is that the distinction between stimulus-driven and non-stimulus-driven correlations is a distinction that we can draw because we're standing outside the system and have independent access to the stimulus. It's not, obviously, a distinction that the brain can make about the stream of data that are coming in. So at some level, I could say, well, if what I wanted to do was to measure correlations for the sake of doing anatomy, course, was originally why people did it. They didn't originally. I mean, if you go back to the 60s, right, when people started measuring correlations, they weren't doing it because they were thinking about combinatorial coding. They were doing it because they were looking for a surrogate for an anatomical connection. And so then in that case, it's absolutely critical that you dissect which, which correlations arise from common input and which correlations are anatomical in origin. If you're looking at this array of signals coming into the brain, you say, well, the brain's got to deal with, this, with these patterns. Tell me something about the statistical structure of the pattern then it might or might not be useful to tell you which, which correlations come from the stimulus and which ones are intrinsic. Oh, but if you have a coding perspective, you still need to do it, right? Um, if, you to, if you ask, what are you coding? We could discuss that. I, I'm not even sure about that. What you really need to understand is which of the symbols, what do the symbols stand for? And that, the answering that question might be aided for us by understanding the origin of the correlations, or it might not. But here, we have a concrete, so this is all philosophical. We also have a concrete answer, <laughs> which is that um, we tried out the idea um, for reasons that, given the character of your question, you must realize. Um, we tried out the model in which every neuron is conditionally independent given the stimulus. Because, in fact, the structure of the experiments will be showed the same movie many times, so we could measure firing rate as a function of time for each cell independent. First point, that's a model with a lot of parameters in it. Now, because of the structure of the experiment, you can measure them. It's not hard. But you realize that it's got lots of parameters, right? Because in principle, every cell has a different firing rate at every, in every time slice. Okay? So very quickly, uh, you have as many parameters as you have states. Right? So if I have 10 cells and I run for, uh, I don't know, 20 seconds at uh, 10 millisecond resolution, and you can work out the numbers, lots of parameters. Um, it turns out that if uh, so, let's think about um, so. Here's uh, let's take an axis which is entropy. So here's the real system. Okay, um, let's say these ten neurons. If I look at a slice of their activity, it's got this much entropy. If I pretended that all of the cells were completely independent of each other, not even not conditionally independent completely independent, then they would have this much entropy. So when we talk about correlations, what we're talking about is this, this difference, okay, which is also called the multiple dimension. So you could ask, um, when we make this model, because it's a maximum entropy model, of course, it never gets exactly down to here. Right? It gets close. So you know we get somewhere. So you can ask, what fraction of this gap do we explain? And so there is some, this is what they call pi, let's just call it delta S, right? It's the entropy gap. And then you could ask, what's the entropy gap that's explained by our Eisenbach? And the answer is, you know, sorry, uh, let's do it like this, right? So, um, you know, if I take a group of 10 cells, some of them are more correlated than others. 
And if I look at what fraction I explain, um, a lot, most of the groups that we look at, we're explaining 90% of the, of the entropy gap. And importantly, we do better when the population that we look at happens to be a bit more correlated. If you take the model in which you say, well, no, 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 none of this, let's assume that all of the correlations are inherited from the stimulus. Then you get this. And you drop down to something like explaining 50%. So there's two points to make here. One is that since this number comes out to be 50%, what it's telling you is, yeah, you know, some of it comes from the stimulus and some of it comes intrinsically, and they're about equal, so sorting them out is going to be hard. It's not that you're, you know, you're seeing correlations and that means anatomy, or you're seeing correlations and it's all inherited from the stimulus. You're right there in the middle, which maybe makes sense if you think about it, right? I mean, you wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to build a nervous system whose correlation properties are all entirely intrinsic, right? You'd like some of your states to be related to what's going on in the world, right? especially in the retina. On the other hand, if all you do is follow, then probably that's not that interesting either, so you're somewhere in the middle. The other point worth making is that, that in some sense, the, the place where the conditionally independent approximation is better is sort of the wrong case. It's the case where the population is less correlated. And so it's not, it's not a particularly useful simplification. So what we think is that, that you, these don't really have a kind of microscopic they really are just a phenomenological description of the states of the system. And if you try to dissect, you discover that each of them came more or less equal. You know, probably, well, it could be that half of them come from the stimulus and half of them come intrinsically, but that would be weird. The more natural, the more natural guess looking at this is that in some sense, every term you write down has some contribution from the stimulus and some contribution from intrinsic circuitry. And if you wanted to peel it apart, it would be hard. But so are you saying that the part that comes from the intrinsic circuitry, I mean, is that too useful for, you know, optimizing coding or... I, mean, I don't know. Back to your original yes, question. Yes, I don't know. Um, so, I could certainly imagine, um, right, well, I think it's hard, right, because... Um, Let's say that I, one of the things the circuitry does is to shape your receptive fields, right? When I change the shape of my receptive fields, I change how much they overlap, which changes both intrinsic parts of the correlations, because they're common noise sources, and it changes the character of the stimulus-induced correlation, right? Sort of for the same reason. So I, I don't even know whether the system whether in a, real, in a real world situation, if you imagine that, you know, imagine that every place you have a connection between neurons, you also have a knob, okay? Just the extreme case. It's not clear that you can turn a knob and change the intrinsic part of the correlations and the, and the stimulus-induced part of the correlations independently. So it might be that not only are they entangled at the level where we're looking at them, they're also, in some sense, entangled at the level of the circuitry. And so then, in that case, when you talk about, well, there's some goal that you're trying to, op that you're trying to optimize for, it, it may be that that, that goal is not statable separately in terms of those two terms. But it should still be the case you can, the downstream neurons, if they're aware of what's going on, right, can figure out what part of this is inferior to those two different, even if you can't separately control them. Like, if I'm understanding, I think, I think your job is to figure out what this world which, saying, which yeah. words go, which sure. which states of the system go with actually not even with what happened in the world, but with what I'm supposed to do about it. Right? No, okay. <laughs> so, but, but which, by the way, was I mean <laughs> that that was the part, the one third of the talk that I didn't give. Never mind. Um, you know, I, I think that, no, sure. that we um, it's I mean this is a sort of philosophical point, right? But but. When you're only recording from one neuron, okay, and you want to tell, you say, tell me something about the code that this neuron uses. In some sense, there's nothing to measure except, right, the, the output of the neuron is pretty simple, right? It spikes, it doesn't spike, okay, you look at some window of time, there's some set of intervals or whatever. And so you ask, well, how is that related to what the input was? 
and so I have to measure both of them. But you know, when you start looking at a population of cells, you can ask you can ask other questions that don't refer specifically to the input, right? You can ask questions like, if I'm looking at the states of the system, can I predict what the next one is? Right? Which is a question truly intrinsic to the to the stream of data that you're getting, and thus doesn't require you to be standing outside. Or you can ask, how do I process this stream of data so that I consistently produce outputs that have certain properties in relation to states of the system I observe in the future. Right, so I, I think that, that our collective, I mean our, our focus as a community on, on understanding the sort of detailed mapping between states of the world and, and states of the neural activity, um, that may not actually be the question. I mean, it's a perfectly logical question. As you know, one I spent a certain amount of time worrying about, but it may not be actually the best formulation for the problem because it's not literally a problem the system ever has to solve. Right? I mean, when we first tried decoding spike trains to recover exactly what the stimulus was, many sort of real biologists immediately said, "Yes, but the nervous system never needs to know exactly what the stimulus was." Okay, well, it's true, right? But what, we, were, we were trying to ask, "What can I tell you about?" what's encoded there, right? We didn't mean the system actually solves that problem. But nonetheless, we keep talking about the problem in, in, in these terms. And you know, I'm starting to wonder if the people who complained to me 20 years ago didn't have a point, which is the nervous, not only does the nervous system have to solve this problem, it's not clear that it has any data with which to solve it, right? It has no independent access to the stimulus. And whenever we think about solving the problem, we always imagine we have a list of stimuli and a list of responses which might understand the mapping. The nervous system can't do that. So it's got to, it may do something that ends up being equivalent to that. So it might have some model, right, that learns some hidden latent variables which are equivalent to the variables of the stimulus. But that would be a pretty good trick, right? I mean, <laughs> if you could show me how to do that, that would be great, right? So I just look at these outputs and I, you know, I'm waving my hands, right, and in, in, in front of the retina, and you tell me how to process these outputs so that you recover the position of my hand without ever seeing what I'm doing. That would be a pretty good trick. But that's more like what the problem the nervous system has to solve, right? It doesn't have access to what my hand is doing. And of course, it's not only my hand moving back and forth in much richer space. So in that sense, I really don't think, I find the distinction between sort of stimulus-driven and non-stimulus-driven correlations, I think that's something we care about because of the questions that we ask about the nervous system. I don't know that it's a question that the brain cares about. That's fair. I, you just, but you made a comment that because it's around 50 percent, it suggests it's hard, and these things might be hard to untangle. But I think the fact that you have a better model that performs better and captures more of the entropy says that, well, with the right framework, maybe artificially, I mean, some of the nervous is doing, but one could account for this. Right. So, what, so, so there's two. So there's two things to say here. Right. One is that there, you know, it's about half, and so it's going to be tough to disentangle. And the other thing is that the model which gets you half is actually a pretty damn complicated model. And so the fact that you can do much better at capturing the, core, capturing the shape of the probability distribution yeah. with many fewer parameters um, certainly says that if that was your goal, then you should do this and not that. You know, I think you might say, well, but you're telling me the shape of the distribution, but you're not telling me what the, what the code words mean. I see. And so then we have to have a discussion about whether understanding the shape of the distribution is of any use and knowing what the code words mean. Okay, that's a longer talk. Okay.